AEW Unrestricted, the official podcast of All Elite Wrestling. Aubrey Edwards and Will Washington here chatting with you about all the exciting things that are happening at AEW with exciting talent at AEW. Will, how are you doing today? I am doing so great. We're, uh, we're just a little bit into the start of 2024. We're a month in. And uh, yeah, I, I feel like there's so much exciting stuff that's already happened, but so much exciting stuff on the horizon and like we're approaching the the end of sting's career and uh, like this was something that you know when we learned about this at at, back in the fall it was like oh we still got time right like revolution so far off but now it's like right around we don't i know yeah we we got like a (laughs) month to go and it's hard to believe that this is it that we're vastly approaching the end of sting's career and uh we're vastly approaching revolution um and greensboro is gonna be uh, a hot time dude i'm like normally we do this sounds like kind of weird but like we do a lot of pay-per-views now so like i kind of only get into the pay-per-view mindset maybe like two three weeks out but like i have been all about revolution since this sting announcement happened and we've had multiple pay-per-views since then so it's like what the hell man like i'm so excited about revolution it's going to be in greensboro in one of the biggest arenas that we've done the greensboro coliseum it's nearly sold out like it's it's insane i'm so so excited there's the young bucks like, there's like all this crazy shit happening i'm so excited well uh, this is gonna be exciting and please revolution revolution <laughs> and i am very pleased to welcome this guest she just recently made her debut in AEW and recently just found out what the difference between a debut and an arrival is. <laughs> it's the one and only Deanna Perrazzo. Deanna, thank you for being here on AEW Unrestricted. Thanks for having me. Uh, okay, so I need d- to know what's the difference between a debut and an arrival because I don't know either. <laughs> uh, no, so it's official terminology. A debut represents your first in-ring appearance as in uh, once you've competed in action. An arrival okay. is when you've stepped into the arena, uh, you've arrived on the scene, you know. So, for example, what happened with Deanna uh, and Mariah May, that was Deanna's arrival in AEW. But her debut gotcha. in AEW was her match with Red Velvet. And so uh, we, those are two distinct terms that we very much use you know. when putting the show together. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> and you got to do both in a very short amount of time. What was that like? Yeah, um, I feel like the last two, two and a half weeks have just been crazy, um, but in such a good way. You know, like I am just ha- trying to learn like a new system, how to be on the road, um, you know, every week. This is something I've not ever done. So I'm just trying to like adjust and like figure out my sleep schedule and a packing schedule and also like when do I see my husband and my dogs and those kinds of things. So, but it's been great and it's um honestly it was a dream come true to to be able to debut or um I'm sorry arrive arrive um, <laughs> in New York with my family and all the things. It was really just more than I could have ever imagined. I want to talk about yeah. that night specifically. Um, yeah. So, yeah, of course, it was the first Dynamite of 2024. Uh, we were in the Prudential Center in Newark, New Jersey, and uh, you surprised the world uh, arriving in AEW. Um, let's talk about, one, how difficult was it to keep that a surprise? Who, who, who exactly knew about that? Um, I, honestly, it was not very difficult because it was so last minute. Like, mm-hmm. I got a phone call to, would, would you come to Newark um, on Tuesday night? So I only had like 24 hours to keep a secret. And um, the only a, people that knew, yeah, yeah, the only people that knew were my husband because he was going to come with me. Um, my dad and my stepmom and my in-laws who were going to come to the show. And uh, um, like, Britt Baker, obviously, Chelsea Green, my two best friends. Um, and I didn't tell anyone else. Yeah, you and I had talked the night before and uh, mostly about getting your theme music together. That was uh, everything that we, we kind of, uh, I, I connected you with Mikey Ruckus and it was like, okay, let's let's get this together. Let's make sure that this is something that is befitting of the Virtuosa and uh, and you know, honestly, I if I remember correctly, you didn't even get to hear it until that day, until Wednesday. 
Yeah, at like, you know, four or five o'clock. <laughs> and we made some small tweaks and it was just like, I, I don't even know what, what it's going to sound like in an arena. I don't know like at what queue do I enter? Like nothing. It was all just such a whirlwind of, of those 24 hours that um, everything happened last minute. Oh, I, so I love that it's like uh, winging it, the AEW story. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, there's it, so it's, much stuff it's that we're one just of like, hey, things... let's just do it. <laughs> it. It was very much one of those things where, uh, you know, you, you, yeah, even from a creative standpoint, you want to play it as close to the chest as possible. And uh, yeah, a lot of those things can, can happen. Uh, in a way where very few people, including people involved, are told. And so, uh, uh, but it, it, it was great. It was such a great moment. Um, and the crowd, the crowd gave Ooh. you so much in that moment. Uh, 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 tell me about that feeling. Yeah. Um, you know, after the fact, I, I realized that I've never even like had a promo segment or anything like that in front of that amount of people. <laughs> Um, so that was the first for me. And I, I feel like I'm a very emotional person, particularly for wrestling, not for very much else in my life, but for wrestling, it's just, I've wanted to do this since I was a little kid. So everything is like, this is a dream come true. And, and, um, to be in, and, and when I talked to Tony Khan, I was like, I don't know if you know, but I'm from New Jersey. The first dynamite of the new year is in New Jersey. And, and I'm just throwing this out there that that's a dream come true. Um, so yeah, it was just like a whirlwind of emotions. And then I get the the crowd reacts and I'm like, oh God, okay, that was good. They know it's me. They're excited for me. Good. And then I get in the ring and my dad and all my parents, but my dad specifically was front row at the hard cam. And I see his big head, literally the first thing <laughs> I see when I get in the ring. And I'm like, don't, don't you can't cry in the ring, Deanna. <laughs> it's going to promo in two seconds. So that really got me. And I was so thankful that as soon as Renee started to speak, the crowd chanted my name because it just gave me a second to like recollect myself and not literally be crying on the microphone. <laughs> my my favorite part of that is like you you're at the Prudential Center, which is this huge building with thousands of people, but then as soon as you see one person you know, it's just all of a sudden like <gasps> Oh yeah. my god, I, I like you just freeze up or like get really nervous. Like it doesn't matter before that moment, but the moment you see someone you know, you're just like, oh God, this is terrifying. But like, you totally nailed it. It was incredible. Thank you. Thank Brian you. has this match, you come in like totally badass, just like, hey, I'm here, I'm coming after Tony, like this is just an incredible moment. And I'm really happy you're here because I have loved watching your career. Like we worked a little bit, I think in 2018, I didn't get a chance to really like work with you too much. And I'm super excited to get to work with you. Yay, selfishly. I am too. Um, yay. Uh, but like you've been killing it over at Impact slash TNA, whatever they are now. Um, you were three-time Impact Knockout Champion. You were the Impact Knockouts uh, World Tag Team Champion, among other things. Like we'll, we'll talk about all this. Like you've had an incredible run so far. So what's sort of been the biggest difference i know i know you mentioned travel like when you're going to see your dogs and husband but what have you noticed so far has been the biggest difference coming to aew um i really just think it's the the scale of the company um you know at impact it was impact when i was there it's officially tna now but um it's it's such a I don't want to say it's a skeleton crew, but it is. Um, you know, everyone has has multiple jobs. We're in smaller venues. There's smaller crowds. Um, you know, if I need to fix my travel, there's one person who does that. If I need comp tickets for my family, there's one person who does that. And I think just adjusting to not knowing um, who is in what department and who to go to for whatever question I have, and and just the scale of the production here at AEW um is is been such the difference for me oh that's uh yeah, yeah no I, I actually you know <laughs> thinking about that i can imagine um that is almost a, a tad bit daunting because uh you know prior to impact of course you were also in wwe um you were in nxt for a number of years and uh you had a brief main roster run but it wasn't necessarily because during the pandemic right yes so it didn't uh, you didn't necessarily get the the crowd scale per se. You, mm -hmm. It was still all at the performance center, so it was almost uh, 
not much of a move at all, right? Yeah, not at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it was weird because it was like, am I being called up? Am I not being called up? Like, no one kind of knew. And um, I would just, like, get a flight to Raw and then not not go for another three weeks and then get another flight to Raw. So I just, I, at that point, um, especially being in, primarily in the Performance Center for the whole two years I was there, and just, like, little live events that have a couple hundred people, like, this is really, like I said, the first time that I'm going out there and there's thousands of people in the crowd consistently. And, um, you know, again, just to for them to recognize me and especially being the first item of the new year, there's been so many talks about free agents and who it could have been. And just for them to be like, it's Deanna and be as excited as they were kind of was like the cherry on top of like, okay, this is all paid off. They know who I am. We're good. You know, almost to peel back oh the curtain a little bit, um, I will say uh amongst i'm not going to name any names because that part doesn't matter but i will say amongst uh <laughs> some individuals backstage there was a honest debate over whether or not uh the AEW fan base was going to know Deanna Perazzo and how we should go about introducing you and the thing we ultimately settled on was that we know the AEW fan is smart and we're going to yep. trust the AEW fan in this regard we're going to trust that in this particular moment they're gonna know and they're gonna react well and uh it's it's nice to have your trust rewarded in those moments where uh we left it up to the fans they heard your music and uh they saw your name come up and they they popped huge they gave you the chant as you were in the ring um they chanted new jersey like it, it was a good moment it was a great moment for you i thought i was so happy for you in that and i, I love that that trust of the AEW fan came through yeah absolutely um but also great. it also speaks to somewhat of the memory of the AEW fan because this was not your first time performing for AEW. Nope. uh nope. this wasn't your first time on dynamite um <laughs> nope. and uh because you also wrestled in the main event of Dynamite in 2022 when you took on uh, Mercedes Martinez for the Ring of Honor Women's World Championship to the uh, officially, uh, because at that point we had an interim uh, Ring of mm -hmm. Honor Women's World Champion um, due to you having prior commitments at, uh, what was that, Supercard of Honor um, yeah. that, that weekend. Uh, when the uh, So at that point we had to crown the lineal champion. Uh, you were the lineal champion at that point, and that had to be settled. But you did get to wrestle in the main event of AEW Dynamite at one point. Uh, yeah. So this was almost like a coming full circle for you in a way, wasn't it? In so many ways. Um, of course, you know, having that experience in wrestling Mercedes in the main event, um, there's only been a handful of women who have main evented, and I get to say that I did that before I was mm -hmm. even employed to the company. So that is like... Uh, you know, something I'm no going to have deal. to pull out at some point um, and remind these girls. Um, <laughs> I like that little wink right there. That was like great. <laughs> I was supposed to be, um, in 2018, I was supposed to wrestle at All In. And I, I pulled out to go to NXT, so I didn't get to do that. I didn't get to do the Jericho Cruise, the first one in 2018, because I went to NXT. So I feel like being able to, like, do these things and live in these moments is, is it's all full circle, because there were so many opportunities that I chose not to do for a different opportunity that now i'm getting to to redo my past and it feels really cool that feels super awesome um you had mentioned that all of this happened really quick uh yeah. when was your first conversation with tony khan about coming to aew i had i spoke to tony the beginning of december him and i were able to finally like connect and get on a zoom call and talk um, and we had only talked once and then we kind of went through like the whole legal process and the contract signing and things like that. And then I hadn't seen him until I got there Wednesday and was about to go out. Wow. That and guy. he's really excited and he's like, let's fucking go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's great because that's uh, uh, knowing that process and, and knowing how quickly that all came together. I, I, I remember the, the conversations in December where it was like, okay, we're, uh, we're, we're bringing in Deanna and, uh, and it was funny because the uh, the rumor mills started to... It, it was nice to see for a change, the rumor mill not fully get their hands on it. That uh, it was like almost the closest we got was I saw a story come out the day of your arrival that said that AEW had talked to Deanna. And I thought, oh my God, we're way past talking. This is... Uh, <laughs> this is... Yeah. 
and honestly like that i think that aided to the fact of like okay the audience was really excited for this mm-hmm. but then also like to go online after the fact and just see like all my friends that i didn't get to tell uh-huh. and and um you know the fans who who were genuinely surprised just like it was very overwhelming the amount of like love that i got from it um and like i didn't think you know just because tony and i hadn't spoken since that initial conversation um i didn't think it was going to happen you know i didn't hear anything until tuesday night so as you know tuesday's go- monday happened tuesday happened and i'm like oh no one said anything like it's probably not going to happen the rumor mill's going around and i'm kind of like oh like don't be upset you know the contract is signed so i will debut at some point but like don't be upset if you don't get to do this in newer you know it's okay um so then when i when i got that phone call sanjay duck called me and i was like oh my god yes yeah it's happening i got off the phone i started crying <laughs> but i was like i'm, I'm doing it it's real it's happening um so just the fact back that like the entire world was surprised i was genuinely surprised but the entire world was was really really rewarding it's it's super great, not only when you can surprise wrestling fans, but when you surprise people in wrestling, because we like to think that we know everything and like we don't. Yeah. But to see good people doing cool things that make them happy, that make your company happy, like it's it's super awesome. This is this is this is great. I'm so happy you're here. <laughs> this has been an Me awesome too. conversation with Diana Perrazzo. We've got so much coming up here on AEW Unrestricted. Unrestricted. AEW Unrestricted, Aubrey and Will talking to one of the latest signees at AEW, one of the amazing additions to the women's roster, Gianna Perrazzo. She's done so much in wrestling, and I'm so happy she's here, and she's going to bring all of her talents to help us and make our women's roster like even, even that much stronger and more exciting, and I'm super, super dope, super, super excited. I don't even know how words work anymore. That's how excited I am. <laughs> Um, I want to talk a little bit about your first match since we talked about the difference between arrival and debut. So you have your arrival in New Jersey and Mm -hmm. then immediately the next show at Collision, you have, is it the next show on Collision? No, it's, it's two weeks. Oh my God. I, I don't have a, I'm still writing 2022 on everything. Sorry. Uh, (laughs) Shortly after you have a couple weeks and then literally you're on collision facing red velvet so what was that like and how is it different to sort of have your arrival versus your debut i feel like when it comes to being in the ring and doing the wrestling i have like no worries whatsoever so going into collision um which was this past saturday uh i i felt just like normal i was like hey i got this like the wrestling for me is I don't need to stress about that. What was going to be different, and it ended up not, we didn't have any commercial breaks in our match, but um, okay. I, that's what I was most worried about. I haven't had like a live TV wrestling match since oh, that honey. match with Mercedes, <laughs> um, <laughs> with commercial breaks or anything like that. So I was like, if we get like a picture in picture or something like that, how do I do that? That was what I was worried about. The like, back end stuff but the actual wrestling the getting in the ring and, and wrestling that was like i got that that's good uh, that's good uh, yeah that's yeah, the easy I, part I, I, well <laughs> ahead, no, i was gonna say yeah I, I again it's amazing to think about the parts that um because you've had such a story career already up until this point um, the stuff that you still haven't necessarily gotten to do these are things that are aren't even occurring to me um yeah <laughs> but no, I was actually glad to see you guys get that single segment match. I know that um, those can be uh, kind of people have different feelings about them. But I think as far as giving somebody the ability to showcase themselves to the world without kind of any interruption, I think is is really great. And I think that for you guys to get that entire time, that entire segment with just the two of you um, without that interruption, I think uh, was really important. And I think it was really important in establishing who you are to the audience. Um, And I think, uh, and yeah, I felt like Red Velvet was almost the perfect opponent for that. I I really loved the line that you had dropped on Dynamite prior of uh, asking her about her stirring arm. I thought that was uh, excellent. (laughs) I thought that was was really good. Uh, Honestly, just genuinely watching it back, I was like, Ah, I see where this is going. This is great. <laughs> yeah, it's been really interesting because I feel like, you know, obviously Tony Storm is, is such a uh, outrageous character. And 
um, you know, I'm trying to realize that this is a new audience for me. And there is a lot of people um, in the AW fan base who might not know who the Virtuosa is. So how do I take these these little lines and kind of implant them and plant some seeds in Easter egg? And you know what I mean? If I don't have a uh, opportunity to be like, the literal definition of the virtuoso is blah, 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 then I need to find ways to just like insert little things and, and kind of, um, then when you get the, you get the arm bar at the end of the match, it's like, oh, you're rewarded now. You paid attention. You get it. <laughs> now, you know what though? Let, let's talk after this because I think, I think there is a way. And if it happens, <laughs> we'll refer back to this podcast, but I think there is a way to actually do that and do a literal <laughs> definition of virtuous in a cool creative way yeah. we're gonna talk um but <laughs> i like will's like okay how do i build this into the format like mr mm. creative on this podcast yeah, I like, like, literally i'm like <laughs> no i think there's a way to do that like maybe yeah. we can oh i and trust I th- you yeah <laughs> <laughs> I trust you too. it's funny though because i feel like i've spent you know not not so much the last few years because i i think when i debuted at impact they did a really good job of of explaining what the virtuoso was but i think that's just like an insecurity i have is like it's this real it's a unique word and unless you kind of know you don't know and i spent a lot of time in nxt trying to explain and, and get people to understand just like what the possibilities of what a virtuoso could be so i think for me it's really important to yeah be like there it is an actual word and there is a literal definition however we can interpret it many different ways <laughs> Ah, uh, that's great. No, that's uh, and, and again, um, I think getting established in front of the AEW audience is is uh, it truly important for this stage of of one's career, and it really feels like there's a lot of excitement around the fans yeah. who don't know you to get to know you, and the fans that already did know you to to basically be like, oh, just wait till you see what she's capable of. Uh, it, I, I I love that. I love when that happens and it's always exciting for that to happen in the women's division and to see more opportunities for that to take place um let's talk about the the run and impact um which uh actually began in 2020 um Mm -hmm. and that started during the pandemic it was uh you know you were released from wwe in um in 2020 if i remember correctly uh, I, I'm really trying to do this from memory. Um, and then you had made the debut in, in Impact. And again, that was that was such an interesting period, even for AEW, for, for people to have to, for people who are making that transition between companies, but essentially you're doing it in front of no fans. Uh, yeah. And for a lot of people, did you find that to be kind of a good opportunity, though, to rebuild, to... Uh, to get to establish yourself and ne- not necessarily have to worry about the reactions of people in the audience. Yeah. And, and, and I think that, um, like I said, I think Impact did a really great job. Of, like we had um, two or three vignettes we had put together to introduce this new character that was coming in. But then I was also in a weird like personal space and professional space that I didn't even know, like, do I, do I love wrestling anymore? Do I want to keep wrestling? Like, okay, I'm going to try this impact thing, but let's just like, I don't know, like, let's just feel it out and see if it works out for both of us. Cause I just wasn't sure what my next moves should be in my life. Right. And so I think to kind of not have that pressure, um, I felt pressure because I had been very outspoken about my time in NXT and the things that I thought I could bring to the table. So there was like, pressure to bring those things to the table but I think having no fans and also being able to like re-record things or redo things and um, we were just supported a lot of luxury not having an audience and I think I really got to capitalize on having that no pressure like I don't like that let's redo it and really put my best foot forward you had such an incredible run at impact for those three years as we mentioned three-time knockout champion uh but One of the things that I really love, and we we had talked about you main eventing Dynamite, you also main evented a pay-per-view, Hard to Kill 2022. Uh, You had a match with Mickey James in a Texas death match. So kind kind of a big deal already, but then also main event. Like, why a Texas death match, and what was that like putting it together? Um, I think they just wanted to do a Texas death match because we were in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think there was any other <laughs> rhyme or reason to it. 
But Mickey and I had told such an incredible and intense story up until that point. Um, you know, we did uh, a big brawl on her farm and things like that leading up to this match. I attacked her at various other pay-per-views. Um, I think we needed something that was that intense and that, like, when you hear Texas death match, you're like, oh, crap. Like, that, it's just Who's intense bleeding? in itself. <laughs> um, but, you know, I am, I pride myself in being a technical wrestler. I like to do the grappling and the mat wrestling and, um, to, to have weapons and then to have that translate, I think, was the most difficult part for me. Um, on top of, we're the first ever Knockouts pay-per-view main event for the Knockouts World Championship. Um, I was emotional all day about it and trying not to think, like, oh, this is the first time ever and I get to be a part of it. I'm in the ring with Mickey James. It's the first Texas death match for the women. Like, there was just a lot of stakes to that. And, um, you know, it's one of my favorite matches because because of all of that. Well, I'll it's tell always you, Diana. fun when it's like you have something big going on and then you've got like the full glam makeup and someone starts talking to you about how proud they are. And you're like, please stop talking to me. Like, <laughs> please I, stop. Like, 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 oh, my God. Like, please, please just shut up. I need to do this thing and I can't cry right now. Like, I really just need to plan a match. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will tell you, Diana, not only with the, the rules of the Texas death match and AEW being different, but uh, forewarning. In AEW, they're not just limited to Texas. We did two in California <laughs> last year and one in That's true. Grand, Grand Rapids, Michigan. So uh, yes. Texas death can happen anywhere. Um, I need my head on the swivel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, exactly. Um, but yeah, the, you and Mickey James really had, I think, what would be considered one of the more storied rivalries uh, in the knockouts, in the history of the knockouts division, really. Um, you know, Talk about her as as a rival, as as somebody who's been kind of that important piece of your uh, your entire career. Yeah, I, I think that Mickey's just like a living legend, right? Mm -hmm. And so she comes in, and there's an immediate reaction. Everybody knows who she is. She's such a, such a baby face, right? And you just love her. And so I think where I was at that point was I had kind of run through our knockout division. I wrestled everybody. I beat everybody. Um, I felt like the virtuoso was kind of this like evil queen. No one could dethrone at that point. And we really needed a character like Mickey James to come in and kind of burst my bubble. And I think that that's really what we got to do. And we got to see a different side of me where I had to like up the intensity and up the aggression and up like the hatred that when we finally, you know, met at uh, Mickey uh, defeated me for the Knockouts World Championship at Bound for Glory in October 2020 or 2021. And then going into that match, it was like, now I have everything to lose, you know, and I had never been in, in jeopardy like that yet at Impact. So I think um, to work with Mickey and just like pick her brain and learn from someone who has had some of the most storied storylines in women's wrestling, period, um, was really an incredible learning experience for me. But then also to like add that to my resume and the things that I've accomplished alongside her was really, really awesome. So on that topic, because I know Binky's had a storied career, as you mentioned, we've got a ton of women at AEW. Is there anyone in particular that you're interested in wrestling? Oh, well, obviously all of everybody, them. but all of them. <laughs> um, but I feel like Soraya, first and foremost, just because again, such a storied career, such a comeback story, and now we're seeing a different side of her. Um, you know, not kind of being in that like I'm back and I'm wrestling and I shouldn't have been, and you know, um, just to kind of see her little dark side has been really cool. Um, and I think there's so many women in our in our AW women's division that I've never been in the ring with, so it's going to be fun to like get in there with all of them um right now i'm calling out tony storm and tony and i have a very long history together she was one of my best friends for a very long time um we've lived together we've traveled together we've done all that so on the flip side of that it's been really cool to to see people like tony who i haven't been around in a really long time and just kind of be welcomed back a little bit uh well i wanted to ask you about uh, that time of your career uh going back even further talking about stardom uh 2017 mm -hmm. to 2018 um and you know we we've had uh talent on this show very recently uh who also wrestled in stardom who uh you may have confronted uh upon your arrival um but arrival. talk yes uh but talking about your time in stardom um you know why was it important for you to go to japan and wrestle for stardom 
I think, you know, as a, as a kid growing up wanting to be a wrestler, um, a lot of my wrestling education came from like the books that the wrestlers would write at the time. And everyone always talked about what, you know, like a wrestler's wrestler went to Japan and, and that was kind of like a rite of passage. So for me, I think from a young age, it was like, that's something I, I want to do. If I want to be a successful women's wrestler and change women's wrestling, Japan needs to be a stop on my list. And, um, you know, I was really fortunate to go the first time for three months and live with Tony Storm, live with Zoe Lucas, live with a couple of the girls that are now in WWE and, um, you know, make lifelong friendships, but then also um, learn a different style. And honestly, it was something that I struggled to adapt with at first, like just the difference of like American wrestling versus Japanese wrestling. Uh, but then to get to go back and kind of do it again and, and, and uh, do it a little bit better the second time was, was even more fulfilling, I think. Yeah, uh, it's it's funny how we always have those things where we're like, oh, this is the thing that I need to do. And then you do it. And it's like, OK, well, what's the next thing you're going to do? Because 2018, like you had barely scratched the surface at that point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I felt like, OK, like I had worked for WWE so much at that point. I had worked for TNA so much at that point. I had worked for Ring of Honor so much at that point that it was like n none of these places are signing me to a contract. So like what else do I have to do? And um, Chelsea Green actually was the one who set me up with the opportunity to go to Stardom for the first time. And I was like, I will come for as long as you need. Like, you tell me what you need from me and I will do that because I think this is what's going to propel me to the next level. We are talking to Deanna Perrazzo here on AEW Unrestricted, the virtuosa with Will and Aubrey. Much more coming up. AEW Unrestricted. It's Aubrey, it's Will, but most importantly, it is our guest, Deanna Perrazzo. And we are talking about kind of all things talking about the arrival in AEW, talking about uh, the past and impact. We talked about stardom. Um, but I, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, uh, you mentioned you grew up a pro wrestling fan. Uh, and you, you mentioned this is something you always wanted to do, something you always wanted to be. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, what were some of your inspirations growing up? Who were the wrestlers that you looked to? What, what was your fandom like as a kid? Um. I loved Trish Stratus. I loved to love her and love to hate her. Um, her story with Mickey, obviously. Um, Lita was one of my favorites. Um, but then also, it, it's really funny. Chris Jericho was one of my favorites. And I, him and I got to share that the other day. Um, oh, yeah. You, you just know, recently did talk as Jericho. Yes. Yeah. And <laughs> at the end of it, he's like, so what's your favorite match? And I'm like, actually, it's yours. And he was like, well, I was asking of yours. I'm like, this This is really awkward. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, um, yeah I really loved and I, I still do like just when I need some inspiration I always go back and like watch like the cruiserweights and and, and um, Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko and that those like that type of style really inspired me so you had trained in New Jersey uh, with Damian Adams uh, how did you end up finding uh, this this wrestling school because I know everyone has like different uh, different stories of how they ended up wherever they ended up. Yeah, I um, I was going to community college and I just drove a different way. Um, and, you know, obviously I had always wanted to be a wrestler <laughs> and there was one wrestling school, you know, while I was growing up that would take students at 16. And I begged my parents and printed out the paperwork. Like, I just, I'll get a job, then I'll get a car, then I could take my set. Like I had it all figured out. And they were like, no. Um, no. So... I was going to community college and I, yeah, I just drove a different way. And there was a big sign at like a VFW hall that said, you know, pro wrestling the first Friday of every month. And I was like, oh, I had never been to an independent wrestling show. Maybe I'll just want to go check out the show. Like what, what's independent wrestling have, you know, that's different from WWE. Um, and then when I Googled it, they had a wrestling school and I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to wrestling school now. Uh, and I went the next week and signed up. Yeah, the, that quick, that easy. And uh, I, I suppose, you know, you mentioned y your parents giving you the uh, kind of no on that one. Uh, talk about what their, how their evolution, everybody has that story. Uh, but what was their evolution like going from the, that no to sitting front row at, uh, at the Prudential, <laughs> Prudential Center? Center. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, my dad never really got it. I don't think, um, he wasn't a wrestling fan, um, really, or, or never told me he was, um, and just kind of like, 
and you know, in the early 2000s, women's wrestling was totally different. So I think what he envisioned me doing wasn't what a dad would maybe envision their daughter doing. And so he, yeah. he just wasn't about it, you know? And my mom, who, who was always supportive of everything I wanted to do, was just like, if that's what you want to do at 18 and you could figure that out for yourself, then I will support you 100%. But like, I'm not sending you into the lion's den as a kid at 16 with so many other things going on in my life. Um, you need to wait. But if that's what you want to do, then one day you can do that. And uh, my mom had been to so many independent shows. She'd been to um, a ton of impact shows. Um, but there was one moment that my dad finally got it. And I made I made him come to um, Hammerstein Ballroom for a Ring of Honor show. And he has a co-worker oh, nice. who's a really big wrestling fan. And he was like, could Mike come to the show? And I said, the only way I'll get Mike a ticket is if you come with him. Like, you're done dodging me. It, you're coming to the show, too. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he walked in. And and I'm really glad this was his first experience because, you know, Hammerstein is, is huge, right? And at that time, with the Bullet Club and, you know, the elite, the whole audience was covered in Bullet Club shirts. And, you know, um, he just kind of, like, looked around like, oh, I get it. And I had wrestled. And then I went and I got like popcorn and drinks and I went and sat with him and his friend for the rest of the show um, in the back. And he was like, Cody Rhodes was wrestling. And he was like, you didn't tell me you knew Cody Rhodes. That's Dusty Rhodes' son. <laughs> and I was like, I did not know that you knew Dusty Rhodes was. And we just had this really cool bonding experience of like, oh, you do know a little bit about wrestling and you maybe pretended you didn't. Um, and then after so fast forward now i make my debut there's my dad i'm hysterical crying um when they came to the back he had said to me like i think i'm a wrestling fan now like what other <laughs> <laughs> what other place can you go to and you could cheer and you could boo and you could say nasty things about people and everyone else in the audience is doing it and you're not being judged like he had the time of his life at prudential center um, and there's only been a few times I've seen my dad so happy and so like, just, just like free and loose and excited. And my wedding day was one of them and Prudential Center, <laughs> Newark, January 3rd, 2024 was the other time. <laughs> those, those are two good ones. I mean, if you're going to put them on the same scale, that's, it's pretty great. It's like, oh yeah, you know, debut arrival in hometown in front of your family yeah. versus wedding. Like those, those can be tied. That's pretty good. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> They're up there. So, I had said the other day, like, the best day of my life, you know. And S Steve, my husband, was like, oh, your debut was the best day of your life? And I'm like, what? The second best. <laughs> <laughs> They're different. They're very different. For different like, reasons, they're the best. <laughs> right. It's like you, you can't really compare them. They're kind of the same thing, even though your wedding was, like, all wrestlers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like it's still very different <laughs> like he should get it he should understand like <laughs> he, he does he does he he busts my chops but he gets it <laughs> there we go uh you had mentioned briefly hammerstein ballroom uh roh you were a big big part in sort of getting the women's division uh such a focal point at roh um you had at one point i think it was uh july 2015 um, not yes, 2015. Uh, you and Mandy first ROH match in nearly 10 years. Uh, yeah. What was it like to sort of be a part of this phase of Ring of Honor, being a part of the Women of Honor? I feel like, in hindsight, I kind of didn't know what I was getting myself into. Um, <laughs> I was, as a kid, I was a WWE fan. I I really didn't know that there was other. Um, wrestling out there, you know, until I kind of got into wrestling that I was like, oh, you could, you could go to Ring of Honor. That's realistic. You could go to TNA. That is a really great opportunity. I kind of didn't know these things as a kid planning my career. You know, I was like, I'm going to WWE and that's that. And so to kind of learn as I was going and, and capitalize on all these other opportunities, I don't think I knew the um, gravity of them, I guess. And uh, Mandy and I had just become friends through um, working as like Rose, an extra as a Rosebud at WWE. And she was like, hey, you know, I, I'm really pushing to start this women's division at Ring of Honor. Like, would you like to be a part of it? And I was just kind of like, OK, that sounds cool. <laughs> like, sure. Um, and I got to go uh, quite a few times down to um, 
the Ring of Honor Dojo, which was just outside of Philadelphia at the time. And uh, I used to just like go down and train. And Mandy and I just had this hope, of, like if we could put a really great match together and train together and show them that like we have something between us, maybe Delirious will give us a match on the pre-show. And um, that July 2015 was the first time. Oh my God, that's uh, the, the thing about just grasping that opportunity and realizing the magnitude of it all these years later. Uh, yeah. I think, uh, again, it's just a testament to the things you've accomplished in your career that you almost don't even realize in the moments that you are actually accomplishing these things. Uh, I wanted to ask you about something you said and kind of bring it back around <clears throat> because uh, you mentioned uh, community college and that you yes. kind of kept driving. Um, but you brought yourself back around to it in 2020. You went back to college and you got yourself a bachelor's degree in history. Yes. Um, so I, I very much wanted to ask you about uh, the decision to go back and uh, and specifically going after that degree. Yeah, um, I think post NXT, I like I said, was just in this weird like I, I kind of don't like myself and I don't like wrestling right now and I don't know like I need to figure out something for me you know and and wrestling was always for me but I think there was so much like when you get into wrestling or or anything you're like this is my dream you never realize the the things that go on behind that you know there's so much that happens to get us through the curtain to do the wrestling and I just love the wrestling you know I don't I'm not like a like I'm not a locker like I don't t try to be outgoing in the locker room and be a leader and you know what I mean like I've, I've been all of those things but it's just happenstance like I'm like I like I'm here for the wrestling right I'm not here for anything else and I think the toll that the rest of the stuff took on me um wasn't for me and going back to school was like I think I might just need to be a normal person and, and not wrestle for a long time um which didn't end up happening but it was something for me it was something for my soul to be like I can put the wrestling aside and focus my energy on something that has nothing to do with wrestling. I can just completely transform into like a little historian and do my research and do my homework, which I love to do, um, and not be tied to any, anything that has to do with wrestling. Um, so it was just kind of like for my soul to like center myself a little bit. That's, that's awesome. Is there any particular like time in history that you like studied or is it more of like a general like I, I don't know how a history degree works my, my background's yeah. in computer science I'm like <laughs> tell me everything <laughs> um so I have just like a general bachelor's in history but so for uh, my favorite time period is kind of like World War II and then like mm. JFK presidency into the Cold War um, so if I was to go for a master's, which I'm thinking about doing, um, that's when I would need to pick like an area. Like, do I want to do American history? Do I want to do military history? Um, but I actually wrote my thesis, like my capstone to get my degree on, um, presidential nuclear rhetoric of the cold war. So that's kind of Ooh. my favorite, favorite. You're thing. a nerd. I love it. <laughs> I am. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my God, that's so great. And again, that, uh, just knowing that um, you got to do that for yourself and got to um, almost re-find yourself, I think, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but that has that, do you feel like that's made you essentially have a better centering on pro wrestling as a whole, like where it now stands in your life and how you operate? Did, do you feel like you got that out of that college experience? Absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, for was eight years at that point, it was just like wrestling, wrestling, wrestling. I did this. What's next? I did this. What's next? And and um, it, that was exhausting. And I think that being able to have outside interests, um, going to school or having my dogs or my husband and the things that we like to do together as, as in our relationship, I think um, just having those things that aren't wrestling has been the most helpful to fall back in love with wrestling because I'm not stressed about it 24 seven. I'm not thinking about it 24 seven. I can say like, I'm going to go do cardio and watch wrestling or, okay, let's go to the ring on Tuesday and train. And then I can come home and shut it off. And I wasn't able to do that for a really long time. And it just ate away at, at my mental health, at my physical health, all the things. Um, so now I feel the most, the most successful, the most confident, the most, happiest i've ever been in my career in my personal life in my in every aspect of it 
it's it's crazy. I literally just had this same conversation with someone backstage. I won't share who because it'll totally break kayfabe. But we were talking about how critical it is to have an interest outside of wrestling for the sake of making wrestling better for yourself. Like yeah. being able to turn it off and focus because it's like you're literally rolling around in your underwear. Like we take it very, very seriously. And there's all these emotional ups and downs, both with, you know, uh, your storytelling your hap that's happening in the ring, your travel, your day to day at the show. There's all of these moments that we forget that we're humans with complex interests and behaviors. And sometimes we need to just shut off that part of our brain and stop thinking about it. And it just makes everything better. It makes your schoolwork better. It makes your relationship better. It makes your background as a wrestler better. It's just so, so great. So I'm really glad that you made that decision for yourself. That's really awesome. Thank you. Oh, man. Um, so fun, stupid stuff. I heard you're a big fan of the chicken strips at Wawa. <laughs> That's my segue. <laughs> Yes, I am. <laughs> so, so like, uh, so for me, I had no idea Wawa existed until I started doing tryouts at WWE. <laughs> like, do they have mm -hmm. Wawa in the Northeast? <laughs> um, there's a few. Like, if you, they're popping up more where I'm from, like in North Jersey, but primarily like down the shore, South Jersey. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. I just needed to know. Thank you for that. <laughs> I was gonna say the last time I had. That I was gonna say the last time I had Wawa, I think, was in the Northeast. I'm pretty sure it was. Uh, God, I'm very visually picturing the hotel and picturing a conversation I had with Justin Roberts while I was trying to covertly hide my Wawa pizza because I was ashamed that that was what I was eating at that time of night. Um, <laughs> Sometimes you got it, man. Sometimes yeah. the only thing open is like fast food, so that's it. It was Philly, Philadelphia. Philadelphia was where it was for certain, 100% certain. It was Philadelphia. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so definitely in the Northeast, I can I can see there being Wawa. I guess I got to try the chicken strips, like literally, because I don't have there Wawa around. But it was the yes. only thing that was open. I don't either. After we, I think I landed at, I don't know, it was like a little after midnight. And oh, yeah. uh, and so I was like, there's literally nothing open right now. I'm going to eat some Wawa pizza. It was terrible. Uh, but it <laughs> came. <laughs> it came through. That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> no, it, it came through. Yeah. Like it was one of those, like, you know what? It at least hit the spot. But I guess next time it's, it's chicken strips uh, at the recommendation there of the Virtuosa. Yes, and if you're not like trying to be super healthy, you can get a bowl with the chicken strips and the mac and cheese, and that is oh, that's good. Oh man, look look at <laughs> now. Will's eyes are wide. Like I know this is like thinking face to wide wide. I <laughs> this is like everything I would like have to hide from my personal trainer, but like everything that I genuinely <laughs> want. Yes, yeah. Oh, it's one of those like, oh, yeah, I eat really healthy and I bring all my food. And then like catering puts out these awesome vegan desserts. And I'm like, oh, no one needs to know. No oh, one needs to know about this delicious put it, thing. Like, hide it. <laughs> yes. Oh, AEW catering has been that literally Wednesdays are my biggest setback in terms of everything else Dude. I do throughout the week. I can get myself feeling good. And then Wednesday rolls around and then I look around and I'm like, oh, they have gushers. And uh... <laughs> oh yeah, I'm Deanna, so happy. Biggest advice to get used to things because I can't have any of the sweets. So, oh man, that's that's great. Yeah, that's good. Good for you because one of the <laughs> hardest things to get used to at AEW is not just like eating your weight and delicious food and catering. Yeah, <laughs> portion control. It's very hard on the road. <laughs> super super hard. Well, this was a wonderful conversation. Thank you for joining us, Diana. This was awesome, and I'm so. So happy you're here. This is great. Our division just grows even stronger day by day. Deanna's one of those awesome people. I'm so excited for the AEW fan base to get to see her in the ring. We don't see a lot of women technical wrestlers, so it's super, super exciting to just see that breadth of knowledge that's going to just be added. It's going to make everyone better. All of these styles clashing. Yes, it's so good. This Thank is awesome. you so much. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. This is AEW Unrestricted. You can listen to new episodes every Thursday on all of your favorite podcast platforms. We've got the video episodes coming out on Mondays. After that, uh, on the AEW podcast channel, you got Dynamite Wednesday. You got Rampage Friday. You got Collision on Saturday. You got ROH on Thursday. We're nearly every day of the week. There's so much wrestling. You can watch this awesome gal, Deanna, now as much as you want. It's incredible. I am Aubrey Edwards with my co-host, Will Washington. Thank you so much for listening to AEW Unrestricted.